From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Another Providence City Council leader in handcuffs. Council President Luis Aponte criminally charged in a campaign finance case. Just one year after then Council Majority Leader Kevin Jackson faced similar charges. The hits keep coming at City Hall. What's the view from the corner office and can the mayor restore confidence in city government? Our guest this week on Newsmakers, Providence Mayor Jorge Alorza. Hello and welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program from WPRI.com, reporter Ted Nisi. And because this is a Providence show, we're also bringing on WPRI.com reporter Dan McGowan. Providence, uh, Providence Mayor Jorge Alorza, thank you very much for joining us on the program. It's Hi, good it's to have you back. Great to be here. So let's start with, uh, with Luis, uh, Luis Aponte and uh, Kevin Jackson. You have called for uh, Council President Aponte to step down as president. Why not demand he step down from the council? Why is it okay for someone under active indictment to continue to have power and can vote on important issues like your budget? Yeah, I mean, I think that he should certainly resign as president. Then, I mean, no one knows exactly what happened. He's the only one who knows. If he is indeed guilty of what he's been accused of, then he should just resign as a council member. Save us all the aggra aggravation, the money, the expense, and the process of having him removed. So he knows whether what he did, what he's accused of, um, he actually is guilty of. And if he did, then he should resign. Well, during the campaign, you said that Michael Solomon was unqualified to be mayor just because he had an ethics complaint against him. Why is it a double standard here? There is no double standard. You know, from the very beginning on this, you know, when, uh, when he was indicted, I called for him to step down immediately. You know, we as public servants, we're held to a higher standard. And that means that, you know, we're, we're accountable to our constituents and we have, to, we have to make sure that we have the moral authority to lead. He has lost that moral authority and so he needs to step down as city council president and then you know the court process is going to going to run its uh, uh, going to run its course but if he in fact Aren't you did still what a leader he's as, a council, as, as a member of the city council with uh, power to vote on important policy issues aren't you a city leader in that position sure. tim what i think is the most important thing here is that if he's city council president then uh, if he's the face of the city council and as we project this progress that we're making as a city do we really want him representing any important institution in the city? Absolutely not. And that he's refused to do up until this point. You know, uh, point number one, step number one, and most important for me right now is making sure that he's no longer the leader of the city council. He doesn't have the moral authority to lead, and he doesn't have the authority to, to speak on behalf of any residents of the city of Providence as a whole. So that's step number one, and that's the most important piece. So at Councilman this moment. Jackson maintained the whole time he still does that he's innocent, and yet he's been recalled. Do you think Ward Three acted too quickly to no. take him out and recall him when he when the court process that you want to go through for Luis Aponte has not gone through for him? Absolutely not. You know, War 3 residents, they felt as though he didn't have the authority to represent them anymore. And if the residents of his of Aponte's ward believe the same, then I fully support that they would go out and start the recall process as well. That's a decision that's made by, by the residents of that ward, and it's certainly something that I would support because these are very serious charges. What was your... What was your personal reaction when you, I don't know, maybe you looked at your phone, maybe you got a call from one of your, your press people, someone else, when you found out that the, there had been, Dan had been reporting for all grand jury yeah. investigations and stuff, but what did you think when you saw you just had <laughs> indicted Kevin Jackson recall? Yeah. Uh, to be honest with you, I took a, took a deep breath and uh, just exhaled and uh, thought that this is embarrassing, uh, this is disgraceful. And uh, it's sad. It's sad for the city. Every time we make progress and we feel as though we're finally hitting our stride and we've left that, uh, that, that legacy of corruption behind, you know, we're brought back to this. And so I think it's a stain on the entire city and it certainly limits all of us in our, in our attempt to move forward. And that's why at this point, step number one, the most important point is making sure that he steps down and resigns as city council president. I don't know what's taking so long. I don't know uh, uh, why he hasn't done it yet. Uh, but I want to make sure that he doesn't represent any in important institution uh, for the entire city. It's bad for all of us. When you got elected to office, um, you knew as the sort of in the you know couple of months before you actually took office, you knew there was this race for council president and for majority leader, and there was lots of reports. You knew for sure that there were uh, both Kevin Jackson and Luis Aponte had failed to file yeah. you know years worth of campaign reports. This stuff has dogged them throughout their first two years on the council here. Um, 
what, is, what goes through your head sort of as you were standing with them at press conferences, as you're meeting with them to discuss policy? And do you ever have to sort of defend them to outsiders who ask about the city? That's a good question. You know, I've had people um, who speak directly with out-of-state developers that are interested in investing in the city, and uh, they've reached back out to me and said, you know, as long as we have sort of that cloud of that representation on the city council, they want nothing to do with the city. Now, thankfully, we have a lot of people that, you know, do believe in the direction that the city's going in, and we're seeing investment in the city right now that we haven't seen in a while, but we don't know what we're missing out on. What other investments, what kind of people we, we could be bringing to the city if we could finally leave behind that legacy? Do you regret that's not why, being more outspoken So then? that's why we've done a couple of really important things here in the city. For the first time in the city's history, we impaneled uh, the city's ethics commission. And in the budget, which ironically is being considered right at this time by the city council, I've called for a full-time person to help with the work of the ethics commission to make sure that we can stay ahead of and send a message that if anyone is even thinking of crossing the line, they're going to get caught and they're going to face consequences. Yeah, but Dan brings up a good point here. You know, we, we knew that they hadn't filed years of campaign finance reports. And you just said something I think that a lot of people might find stunning. You're hearing from people who might want to do business here like, hey, that's a cloud over the city. I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. Why aren't you out there using your powerful bully pulpit to say, file your campaign finance reports? Enough of this. They, you, you guys need to be clean as, as you possibly can yeah. be. It takes an indictment. Yeah. For you to come out and say no, well, something? Let me, no, 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 no. So uh, remember that you know this all happened as a result of him actually filing his him, him actually filing his reports. Remember that it was the ethics commission that I impaneled for the very first time that referred his matter over to the uh, to the state uh, board of ethics. And so we have been taking these, but it's important that as we take these steps, we t we take it um, at a structural level. How do we establish that kind of culture and the kind of institutions so that it's not just about one person, it's institution-wide. That's what we've been doing, and in fact, in this budget, we're investing even more to make sure that the Ethics Commission has a full-time member to make sure that anyone else who's even thinking of dipping in the till, uh, that they know there's going to be I consequences. I want to ask a quick question about that Ethics Commission. It has been in, in panel for two years now, two and a half years now. One complaint the only complaint it had, it kicked to the State Ethics Commission. It was Luis Aponte. So are you, are you telling me there's no sort of ethical vi violations happening with city employees over the last two and a half years? I don't know of any, but what the commission does is a lot more than just that. So for, for example, yeah. everyone who um, serves on a board or commission to the city, you know, we've also created a municipal integrity officer. You know, we want to make sure that proactively they know what's required of them in terms of ethics and also all the steps that they need to take to stay clear of any, any potential conflicts. So this is a matter of being uh, proactive. Um, anybody who's out there and we have any information that you know, they might have done something unethically, then the commission will absolutely investigate. But we want to make sure that we don't wait up until that point. We let them know that the expectation is that everyone is living up to the highest ethical standards and what the consequences will be if they transgress. As a result of the news this week, um, well, we taped this on a Friday, you woke up this morning, you saw the front page of the Providence mm -hmm. Journal, and it asked the question, is Providence crime town? And they're <laughs> citing a very popular podcast right now that just ra uh, wrapped up its first season, focusing on the underworld of Providence. Why don't you answer that question? Is Providence crime town? Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate. I saw the same headline, and uh, you know, it, it's ironic. On the same day that the podcast, on its final week, we have this situation to deal with here in the city. And so, you know, uh, you know what I believe is different now, there is a moral outrage whenever someone violates an, 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 uh, 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 the code of ethics. We've seen it with Kevin Jackson. He's been recalled, and now we're seeing it with Aponte. Um, and uh, you know, I fully expect him to resign from the council presidency. And I want to make sure that that's the level, that's the expectation that we have throughout the entire city for everyone in public office. So times are different, and uh, you know, unfortunately, we're still dealing with this legacy issue. Unfortunately, it's still present. It's still real in politics here in our city. Um, but I'd like to think that we have mechanisms to make sure that there are real consequences for anyone who does uh, violate and cross that line. Have so you that is different. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that we're here. But I'd like to think that 
we have systems in place so that we can rid it from our past and uh, truly focus on moving forward. Have you listened to the podcast? I've listened to about the first 10 episodes. I'm a little bit behind. Do you think it's good for Providence or bad for Providence? I mean, I, I have friends all over the country now. Seeing that they, heard, they said, I heard you in a debate with Buddy Cianci, the one you did <laughs> the other day. Um, but, you know, what are they then asking about? They're like, wow, the fireplace log. Wow, you know, you reelected him even after he goes, that's crazy. That, you guys just don't, there's no rules there. I mean, what do you think about what this is doing to Providence's image? Yeah, I mean, I, it's terrible. No one wants to be known, you know, as having, um, you know, corrupt influences in government or, you know, the, the, the label crime town. I, I, I think it's terrible. But what's even more terrible is that we add fuel to the fire. Mm -hmm. And this last uh, week is an example of it, what's happened over the past year with former Councilman Kevin Jackson. It adds fuel to the fire. And so, you know, what I want to make sure is, first of all, that we set the expectation throughout City Hall in my entire administration that, you know, even the slightest whiff of anything like this is not going to be tolerated and there's going to be consequences. And then making sure that we have the systems in place so that we can both prevent it, but when it happens, make sure that, you know, we're there, so we're there to So no follow plan up. to lean into the crime town, you know, do banners <laughs> or try to office. make it a tourism <laughs> thing, no. You know, no, we won't do that. the la last sort of question on Aponte, um, now nearly every member of the city council, like in fact all but one, has joined you in calling for his resignation. There's going to be a, a special council meeting on Monday calling for a vote of no confidence. I'm curious if you, uh, if you were going to play a role in potentially, you know, supporting a candidate for the next president. We know Sabina Matos will be uh, promoted if he does resign to acting president. Mm -hmm. Councilman Narducci has told me he wants to be the council president and he says he's seeking your support. Would you yeah. support him? So uh, this is my position. To be honest with you, I, I, uh, I, I'm agnostic in terms of who the next president is. Uh, what I want to make sure is whoever the next president is, that we have a good working relationship and uh, that we understand that you know, we're two separate branches of city government, but we have to come together. We have to find compromise. We have to find common ground and uh, we need to work together. Is there anyone you don't want to be the president? <laughs> I don't, I, I, I'm willing to work with anyone. Me. <laughs> Except for you. <laughs> I'm willing to work with anyone so long as, you know, they understand that we're on the same team. Yeah. You know, there's a healthy tension that should exist between the executive and the legislative. I get that. But at the end of the day, we're on the same team. And, uh, you know, I want whoever occupies the presidency to understand that and to understand that even if we're coming at it from totally different perspectives, we have to, f we have to find that common ground. So, you know, I will certainly get involved if I believe that that person will not, um, you know, be willing to find compromise and, and, and common ground. But otherwise, you know, I, I'm agnostic about who becomes president. All right, we've got to take a break on the program. Our guest this week is Providence Mayor Jorge Alorzo. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my left, both from WPRI.com, we have Ted Nisi and Dan McGowan, our guest, Providence Mayor Jorge Alorza. Dan. Mayor, I want to talk about the Community Safety Act. That's yeah. that far-reaching sort of police reform ordinance that's uh, kind of stalled in the city council right now. Uh, chief Clements, sort of pretty well-respected uh, chief, has done a pretty good job by all accounts, um, came out and said he doesn't think the ordinance is necessary. Why is he wrong? So, you know, when we started with the CSA, um, you know, some of the things that were in the original document were very far-reaching. They were, you know, frankly, extreme. But really over the past year, we've been sitting down, we've been negotiating the terms of it with uh, the group of activists and also with the city council. And what we, what we have right now is a very good bill. And by that I mean it's the most comprehensive police community relations bill of its kind. I mean, it covers so many different areas. But it's going to allow us to uh, collect a lot of information and data to get to the heart of these issues. So folks in the community complain about targeting, about racial profiling. Well, with this data, we'll be able to say, yes, there is a problem. No, there isn't a problem. But we'll be in a much better position to do something about it. Have it you also, talked to the chief? Oh, no, absolutely. I've spoken with the chief. Even after his oh, comments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Did I've you spoken have with that conversation? No, we've had that conversation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the... The, 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 the challenges right now are really on the margins. I mean, they're very simple and basic um, uh, sort of disagreements. When you, um, you know, when you think of where we started, there were some core differences that we had to get over. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I came into this, you know, really with two principles that, are, that I wanted to see as the, as the uh, end product of the CSA. The first one, I wanted to make sure that whatever we ended up with uh, did not compromise good policing. 
So I'm confident that the, vi that the, that the um, version we have right now will allow uh, police officers to have the tools that they need to keep us safe. And the second is I wanted to make sure that it actually improved police community relations. You look at over the past 10 years here in Providence and throughout the country, the number of police officers that we employ here is much fewer than we had 10 years ago, but crime is also far lower than we had 10 years ago. And the reason for that is because we're being much more proactive, we're building those relationships, and this bill will go even farther in helping us build did, those did, relationships. Did the chief pledge his support on this new bill now in these conversations you've had? Do you expect him to come out and say thumbs up? Yeah, and we'll manage it. We'll yes, manage he it. is going to support yes, it. Yes, absolutely. And we'll manage the CSA. You know, you know part, of, um, part of the challenge is that, you know, yeah, yeah, with all due respect with the media, sometimes we gravitate towards the loudest and um, sometimes most outrageous voices on this. But you know, what we try to do in terms of policy making is focus on where is the agreement, where is the disagreement. The disagreement right now really is far out there on the margins. But in terms of what we have as a comprehensive draft, it is a very, very good bill that's going to allow us to continue Boy, to keep know our community that, safe. Chief, I heard the concerns and, no, I second. heard the and, night before that second. bill passed. And, and it's pass also, also going to allow us to build those relationships between the community and the police. So you think so Chief Clements is one of the most extreme voices? People who had talked to him were concerned no, about no, no. his future in the city if it had passed that day. Again, that's an extreme position. That's an extreme voice. And we can't let policy be driven by those extreme voices. I have personally had those conversations with the chief, and we have highlighted specifically those areas where you know he has concerns, and I can assure you that in the those concerns bill. in the current bill and oh, those concerns are minimal and they're on the margins. So by the time this comes to a vote in June, potentially, you think the chief will have signed on to the bill? I, I fully expect that, yes. Which incident do you think this bill would have prevented that happened in Providence in recent years? So, I mean, there's a lot of things. So, for example, uh, this is this is about 15 bills in one. Remember that. And I think the most important part of this is the racial profiling piece. So there's going to new, there's going to be a new protocol, a new procedure every time that there's a, a formal stop, um, so that we collect certain information. And all of this information at the end of the year will be aggregated, and this will give us a sense of you know where we need to invest in. Are our practices right? Are is our policing right? And if not, we have the data to support it, and we know where we need to invest. So in terms of ongoing training and ongoing relationships between the community, you know, that's what this is about. I mean, but there are so many aspects. So uh, there's changes to the gang database. So the initial bill, Has that the been initial misused? draft. So, so let me explain. So in the initial draft, the gang database, uh, they were calling for it to be completely abolished. We said, absolutely not. This is an important tool that we use. However, the advocates did make a very good point that you know, we weren't sort of scrubbing or cleaning uh, the list, updating the list every so often. And so what we had were, were people on this list that had been there for years, they're probably completely out of the game and you know, aren't, aren't, aren't a risk. And so you know, the more they're on the risk, the less value this, uh, the gang database has. So what we, what we agreed to is every two years, we're going to scrub the list so we can make sure that it's always accurate and up to date. And uh, those are the kinds of policies that this, uh, that this allows for. It's not about do you support police, do you not support police. Those are the, the extreme voices and frankly that don't know about the specifics of the bill. That's why I'm confident that what we ended up with is something that's going to make the police department better because it gives us a better sense of what we're doing right, what we can, do, what we can, do, uh, what we can be doing better, and it also gives us a sense of where we need to invest. There's been this growing problem of um, ATVs and dirt bikes that are tearing <laughs> through the, uh, the city. Look, you can go into YouTube and find uh, mm -hmm. you know, kids posting these videos. They tore through the park on Easter Sunday. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, one of the parks there. Um, and uh, the Rhode Island Foundation actually said it's caused about $20,000 in damages to, to city parks. Um, you know, I know there was an ordinance passed last year to, I think, a $500 citation. It was beefed up a little bit recently. But why hasn't that ordinance seemed to work? Seems to be getting worse, unless yeah. you have a different perspective. So part of the challenge, and we've, uh, we've increased our enforcement of that over the past several weekends, and uh, we've confiscated about a dozen uh, bikes. So we have them in our possession right now. We're not giving them back. I've been on radio. I've been out there in the community, uh, barber shops, letting folks know that we're watching. And so what we're doing is we have uh, uh, teams of police officers in unmarked cars, and uh, they're tactical squads, and they're working together to pin down many of the folks. Because what happens is that if they, you know, if they get you know, followed by a police officer, 
many of them take off. They take off and that can create you know, safety risks and you know, they can harm someone. So trying to prevent you know, those chases through Providence's streets, you know, now we're working in a very, you know, in a very sort of detailed and, um, and tactical way to stop them. And uh, we've had you know, two, two and a half successful weekends you know, when the weather is nice, they're out. When mm. the weather is nice, they're not so out. Might you um, destroy those bikes? To, so that's a, that's a challenge that we have. Uh, we're working with the law department to see, you know, whether we have to return them. I know that people have showed up and tried to recover them, and we told them that we're holding them for now as we sort through the legal, the legal issues. Last thing we want to do is put them back on the street and have, you know, that same kid on the bike once again. Uh, but this is something that we're taking very seriously. You know, the past three weeks, I think the message is starting to get around that if you're out there on your dirt bike, you better watch out because we're going to be on you. Um, the, your new budget is out. Um, two questions for you on and I know we're not going to get away without you talking up your education <laughs> proposal. So briefly tell us why you're excited about the education thing. And then what does it mean for potholes? Because as a city resident, it is, the potholes are just, they drive people crazy yeah. in the city. So I'm really excited about this budget and I'll tell, I'll tell you why. You know. Um, it's it's really the most important thing because if the finances aren't straight you really can't do anything and over the past couple of years we've been digging ourselves out of the cumulative deficit by the end of the current fiscal year Providence will have a rainy day fund for the first time in a long long time that's very exciting and so now that we have this flexibility in the budget we can make investments and I'm putting every single dollar that we can into two things education and our kids so we're investing from early childhood to summer learning, to summer internships, to opportunities for our young people. That's what, those are where our investments are going, along with 15 additional million dollars to invest in school infrastructure. Now we are all in for education here in Providence, and we're putting our money where our mouth is. Uh, those are, uh, that's the number one investment that we can make as a city, and this is a budget that invests in kids. Like no, bu like no budget that I know of um, uh, for a long time. Kids hit potholes too. What about that side of things? So <laughs> we've increased um, uh, the amount of funding for the school department and seven million additional dollars towards kids in schools. Now, so budgets, uh, 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 potholes. potholes. <laughs> <laughs> so I made it a priority since I took office. You know, back to basics. Let's make sure that city government, uh, city, um, city services are being offered at a high level. So you know, when it snows, it's curb to curb. By the time people wake up the next morning, things like that. When it comes to potholes, the trick about potholes is that you know, there's just so many of them and our roads have been cut open so many times. What we need to do is instead of simply putting patches, we need to repave entire streets. And that's what we're working towards. I put a proposal to invest $40 million into infrastructure throughout the city and it was blocked by the city council. You know, I am not going to agree to ward accounts where they have their pet projects that they can fund, but I think that we're making progress and we're gonna to get to the point where everyone agrees that we need to make these investments. It was put to the voters, it was over 80% approved. People recognize the importance of investing in infrastructure, and I'll be working with the city council to make sure we get that Very done. Very briefly, Mayor, can that still go forward since it won approval if the city council relents or if you come to an agreement with the council? It can. So that was for approval to, to borrow money from a certain, a certain uh, uh, vehicle, but we can borrow money from other vehicles. And I think that it's doing the will of the voters uh, since you know, the question was posed to them and it was, it was approved so overwhelmingly. Two minutes left. Sure, one, uh, one education question yeah. on your budget. Um, Providence is not the only city or, or, or town that has done this, but as the state funding formula ramped up, many communities, including Providence, level funded their contribution yeah. to the school district. That money from the state is starting to level off now next year, in fact, will be the last year of the funding formula. Is Providence going to need to really ramp up its contribution to the school department over the next couple of years? Potentially, that's a good question. And you know, we're going to be at the state house asking for more resources. But you know, what leg do you have to stand on asking for more resources when you don't put your own resources towards it? That's why it was so important this year to make sure that you know we're showing leadership on the issue. And uh, next year, when we're when we're up at the state house and asking them to make more investments in education. We can say, look, we're doing it in our communities as well. We're stepping to the plate and we're making these massive investments in our kids. Uh, we have about a minute left. I'm wondering when the federal government released their list of sanctuary cities that they targeted as sanctuary yeah. cities, uh, were you disappointed Providence wasn't on it? Uh, does that say you're not doing enough for immigrants <laughs> in, your, in your city? So we were on the original list that they came up with, and then they used another list of nine to ten cities that had been worked on a long time ago. So I think that second one is the list that you're talking about. 
you know, we've sat down with uh, Attorney General Sessions, with Secretary <coughs> uh, Kelly at Homeland Security, and we've told them very clearly, you know, um, and this is, this is a group of mayors, that uh, public what safety and security seconds. is our number one priority. And anything that shifts our scarce resources away from serious and violent criminals, you know, we're going to we're, we're, we're going to bristle and we're going to push back on. And so I simply don't think that it's a good use of resources to move them from focusing on serious criminals to perhaps focusing on someone who forgot to put their turn signal on. At the same time, at the federal level, it doesn't make sense for people to go underground. We need them to step up and be witnesses and to report crimes. A lot we didn't get to, car tax, other issues. Make sure you follow Dan McGowan on our website, WPRI.com. For Dan and Ted, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers. You're running. <laughs>